As many cruise passengers point out to me, on the surface, Oceania appear to be basically exactly the same as all the lines they compete with. So people ask me, why do I like them so much? I actually struggled to answer that. So on my most recent Oceania trip, I paid really careful attention. And this is what I discovered about Oceania. If you're new here, welcome aboard. I'm Gary Bembridge, and it's my goal to make it easy and fun to discover, plan, and enjoy unforgettable cruise vacations. So let's go explore Oceania cruises. Who exactly do Oceania compete with? Well, they're in the smaller ship category and what I think of as a luxury area. So this category falls in pricing at least between the larger ship premium lines, so things like Honda America, Princess, Celebrity, Virgin, Cunard, and then on the other side, ultra luxury, all sweet lines like Seabourn, Silver Sea, Region 7 Sea cruises. They actually have seven ships within their fleet, four R-class ships, which carry 694 guests, Insignia, Regatta, Serena, and Nautica. Then they have the Sister Marina and Riviera with 1,250 guests and the brand new Vista with 1,200 guests. So they compete with lines like Viking Ocean, 930 guests, Azamara, 690 guests, Windstar between 148 and 342 guests, and also probably Saga in the UK with around about 1,000 guests. They also compete with small ship lines like Ponant in France, for example. Oceania is like all these lines, I think, in at least five obvious ways. First of all, their ships. The ships are plush, they're smart, they're revamped all of the ships in recent years. The ships are so much nicer than when I first went on them in 2016. Much, much nicer. But Oceania is not unique in this, though, because all the smaller ship lines have upped their game too. They either have brand new ships like Viking or like Azamara and Windstar have undergone big interior upgrades. They have a wide cabin range, ranging from inside cabins up to suites with a butler, which I was actually fortunate to experience when I was upgraded from the cabin I'd booked a veranda up to a suite. Secondly, their fares. In my experience, they're broadly the same as the other small ship lines. On average, as mentioned, smaller ship fares are higher than the bigger premium ships like Celebrity, Holland America, of course, as you would expect being a smaller ship. Oceania fares actually fall within the middle of the smaller ship pricing, with Viking and Windstar usually higher, Viking because it's got more inclusions in the fare, and Windstar as it carries much fewer guests. Oceania has what they call O-Life fares, so you can choose from three added inclusion options, a package of excursions, a standard drinks package, or onboard credit. Their fares include all specialty dining, standard Wi-Fi, soft drinks, regular specialty coffees, fitness classes, and the extra costs are gratuities, and then drinks and excursions based on what choice you've made. The O-Life inclusions do have limits, and so I always go for the onboard credit. The excursions are added per cabin if you go that route, not per person. So it's actually less attractive because as a couple, you're really halving the number of excursions, if you know what I mean. The drinks package is limited, and I've seen most people upgrade if they've gone that route. By the way, Wi-Fi is for one device, and if you really want to do anything much like I do when I'm on board, you need to upgrade to the streaming option. Thirdly, Oceania, like the others, focuses very much on destinations and import activities. Having smaller ships means the ship itself is more of a floating luxury hotel than a destination itself. So I like that Oceania offers me a huge range of itinerary options in all regions. They've got lots of different lengths. They've got smaller and more out of the way ports they call on. Of course, they go to the expected and the obvious as well. But I find the variety really, really appealing. Of course, this is also true of all of the smaller cruise lines. They all cover the same regions, the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, Alaska, Asia, Australia, South America. They also do quite a lot of overnights in ports, although Azamara probably does more than Oceania. Their 180-day world cruise on Insignia, though, is probably the best and the most intensive of all the smaller ship lines. It's the one world cruise of all the lines that really appeals to me. Fourthly, as with all the other smaller ship lines, the onboard experience is very informal and it's very re relaxed. Oceania have a high crew to passenger ratio. It's almost one for one, by the way, and so service is really good and it's definitely attentive. I personally find it much more personal and personalized than I find on bigger premium lines like Celebrity, Holland America, and so on, but it's not as formal as on the ultra-luxury lines like Seabourn. 
more on this later because this is very important. The dress code is what they call country casual. So no jacket or, and no tie is ever required. I do find actually though that people do dress up for the captain's welcome and farewell party, so I always take something kind of smart along. But they don't, they, they actually ask you to not wear jeans in the specialty restaurant at the grand dining room. But if you do, no one actually stops you. I found that out on my last trip. Like cruise lines in this category, Oceania have open seated dining in the grand dining room, their main dining room. The daily program is classic cruising stuff, quizzes, deck games, enrichment talks, enrichment events, live music in the bars, song and dance shows in the theatre, so very, very classic. Now these are small ships, and like all the other small ship lines, these are small scale theatre shows. In my view, the shows on Oceania are very predictable cruise review stuff. They rely a lot on older music eras than I would like, but in practice, all the smaller ship lines are pretty much the same here. Now, fifthly, although unlike Viking, which is for 18 plus guests only, Oceania, in my experience, is effectively an adults only line. I have never been on board with kids or teens. There are no kids clubs, there's no kids facilities, there's no family cabins on Oceania, there's no family excursions, although they do put a little stuff on, I believe, in Alaska. Like most small ship lines, Oceania attract adults mostly and mostly couples over the age of 50. Whenever I'm on Oceania, I find fellow travelers to be really interesting. They're well-traveled, they're active because like me, they're looking new destinations, they're looking for new ports, and they want a smaller, like I do, and more intimate way to get to them. So while Oceania does all these things well, as you can see, all the smaller lines also do them pretty well. So is there anything within there that is different? Well, there are a couple of things. They focus even harder on enrichment, all of those small lines have speaker programs, but with Oceania, I think they go further with three really key things. They have the artist loft on the bigger new ships where an artist in residence runs crafting and artwork classes, which are really interesting. They have a large culinary center, which runs almost daily cooking classes on the three bigger ships. And on Vista, the Cunnery Centre now has its own dining room, which is pretty interesting. There are also large libraries on all of their ships, even the smaller ships. It's not as big as you're going to find on, say, Cunard ships, but it's probably one of the biggest libraries that I've seen on other ships, particularly for its size. However, while these do not really make the Oceania cruise experience that unique, I guess, is there anything beyond that that Oceania does that is truly, truly unique. It's time to talk about food. I'm often asked if Oceania live up to their advertising claim of providing the finest cuisine at sea. It's a slogan, by the way, that they've even trademarked. So do they? Because you could argue that most cruise lines, especially on the more premium side, have upped their food. On recent trips, I've commented how even lines like Holland America, Celebrity, and so on, now have really good high quality food. It seems to me that every single line these days, no matter what category it's in, has a partnership with some well-known celebrity chef or they've created a culinary council to help them improve food. Oceania is no exception. Their partnership is with a chef called Jacques Pepin. He's worked for two French presidents and I believe he's a really big deal in the United States restaurant world. There are a few things when it comes to food that I do think are different on Oceania. All dining is included within the fairs. The grand dining room, the terrace cafe buffet, which by the way, in my view, is probably one of the best buffet restaurants of any line I've been on, no matter what category. Uh, also included is the informal dining and waves grill. They serve things like hamburgers and stuff like that. But also all specialty dining venues are included in the fair. This for me is a big, big factor. On the smaller ships, there are only two specialty restaurants. You've got Polo Grill, which is the steakhouse, and Toscana, which is Italian. But on the bigger ships, when I go on those, I have a huge choice. I've got Red Ginger, really remarkable Asian fusion, Jacques, which is the French bistro. On Vista, they've also got Ember, American classics, Aquamar Kitchen, which is kind of a healthy options wellness thing. And of course, as I mentioned earlier on Vista, you've also got the culinary center dining option. All of these are included in the fare, and you can go to each of those at least once on your cruise. Now, if you're in a suite, you can go to them pretty much as often as you like. You can go every night if you wanted to, to one of them. They also 
by the way, have specialty dining events which do have a charge. They have La Reserve by Wine Spectator, wine paired menus, and you can also then do Privy, which is a, a private dinner party for a group of you. These specialty restaurants are all very, very good. My favorite by far, by a long way, is Red Ginger, that Asian fusion. My least favorite is, because I find it overall fussy, is Jacques. But I'm not a big fan of French cuisine, the Philistine that I am, but other people who like French food really liked it. Now, another big standout for me is Horizons. This is the lounge that overlooks the bow of the ship. Here's where they do afternoon tea every day. It is amazing. It is absolutely one of the best afternoon teas at sea, in my view. Do Oceania have the finest cuisine at sea? I don't know if they have the finest, but they certainly have some of the best cuisine at sea. I found that they consistently, in my view anyway, pip some of the ultra luxury lines in many, many occasions in many restaurants. So what makes them interesting is in terms of value, the amount that I paid to go on Oceania versus an ultra luxury line, I think gives you much better value when it comes to food. But is food enough to say that they offer something different in cruising? Because all lines have great food these days. There is another thing that I feel makes them different, and this has a really big impact. I feel that I have two very distinct cruise experiences based on which of their class of ships I cruise on. As I said earlier, there are the four R-class ships, 694 guests, and the 1,200 Marina, Riviera, and New Vista. They are, in my view, very different experiences. And I spoke to many other people on my most recent trip who'd been on both, and they agreed with me on this. And it's really important, because on the smaller ships, like Insignia, I have a very intimate experience. Of course, there's fewer choices of venues, there's a tiny casino, there's only the two speciality restaurants. But when I was on Marina, it felt like a bigger ship experience. I had a lot of choice. I had the same and even more choice of specialty dining venues than on, say, larger ships like Holland America, Cunard, and even Princess ships. It did feel, on that class of ships, much closer to going on a bigger ship experience, but with a big plus. You don't have the crowds, you don't have the lines, but you do have a lot of choice. And I think it's very important to understand, if you decide to go on Oceania, you have two really distinctive alternatives to think about. Do you want the very small ship with much more limited experience, or do you want a closer to a big ship experience, but with the perks of not having the crowds and the lines? I went with my partner on Insignia, and he was much, much less keen on it because he felt there was too little choice. He wanted bigger production shows. He wanted a larger casino. I, on the other hand, loved it. I liked the smaller, more intimate experience, fewer guests, I got to know them much better, and I was less fussed by not having as much choice. But the bigger Marina, Riviera, and Vista are much more suited to the way that my partner likes to cruise, more choice, slightly bigger ship experience. No matter which of those ship size options appeal, while I think many people could argue there's not that much that sets Oceania aside from the other smaller ship lines, I have come to appreciate that the main reason I like Oceania so much, and the reason I like to suggest it to cruise passengers like you, is because of something much less tangible, which I think they are definitely a notch up on. The overall experience feels luxurious, and this comes heavily from the service and attention to detail. The crew quickly learn my name, they quickly learn my likes, it is ultra luxury cruise line like service, but for a much lower price than ultra luxury cruise lines. For example, the waiters in the terrace cafe and the main dining room, they within a day or so learned that I don't drink alcohol, but I love caffeine free Coke, which was only available in very limited number of bars. They would always ask when I sat down if I wanted one so they could make sure they could go and find one for me. The internet cafe guy knew I was on board doing lots of stuff. Uh, trying to upload videos and things, and he would keep checking in when I passed if the streaming service was working as I needed. Oceania have an almost one-to-one -one passenger ratio. They claim to recruit the state room stewards from the world's finest five-star hotels, and that the butlers have been trained by the Guild of Professional English Butlers. Now, I don't know if any of that is all true, but while the hardware aspects of Oceania are like the other smaller cruise lines, it's the food and that softer side that I think really 
sets them apart. So if you're looking for a small ship experience, but you don't want to go the whole way of going very, very small with the limited choices that comes with that, you've got a good transition by going on Marina, Vista or Riviera. It's a good step away from the 2000 plus ships you're gonna find in Holland America, Celebrity, Princess and so on. You're still gonna have a lot of choice, but if you really do want to go the small ship experience, and the great news is you can go on the smaller R-class ships that I love, but it's still, it's relatively big, it's 694 guests, it's not tiny like say Windstar is. But if Oceania doesn't sound right for you, why don't you watch this video where I dissect and look at Viking Ocean in detail, where I start off by talking about one thing that their fans told me that I was extremely dubious about. See you over there.